you, family. How are we doing this morning? Are you ready to worship the Lord? Yeah. Would you stand, sing, and let's just praise him this morning. This next song is going to be a new song. Um, it's called Unchanging, and in the chorus it says, So we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. So as we're singing that, I want you guys to understand that although we're going through a, a crazy time in this world, um, I, just, I just want you guys to realize that He's so good and He's unchanging.
is a hallelujah, an everlasting song, a never-ending anthem. We sing to you alone, resounding in the heavens and in our hearts today. How greatly we're forgiven and how great, how great will be.
us coming here to just listen and receive. Lord, I pray that you would just give us hearts and minds to just receive what you want us to hear, Lord. And I pray that you would just continue to humble us and that you would just give us that urge to just want to worship you, Lord, and that, that urge to just want to, to live our lives for you and pick up our cross. God, I know that this world is getting crazy, but I pray that you would just give us boldness, Lord. I 
pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, you get some good news. At least Duck Dynasty's doing something. Uh, good night, nurse. I mean, I mean, imagine uh, having uh, auto auto trucks, a, a semi truck, running down the the highway unmanned, and they go crazy because they've already had these unmanned vehicles. Uh, they have like 185 uh, accidents with fatalities and stuff. And you're going to send a semi. Um, and right now they're actually sending them, I think, from uh, Dallas to Houston. They're practicing with them. Dude, that would be the last thing I want on the freeway. But again, um, this is the crazy world, the carnival world, the Circus Vargas, uh, you know, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus that we live in. Um, and California just keeps getting worse. Um, I'm going to talk about California today a little bit. But anyway, we... we we're, we're reached this point in Genesis where we're looking at a time where uh, uh, Jacob needs to separate from Laban, okay? And Laban is his father-in-law. And Laban is, uh, is about as crooked as, as a politician's spine, okay? It's just, he's, he's bad, dude. And, and what it represents is that there are periods of time in our lives where we're dealing with family members that they're so dysfunctional and so toxic, you have to separate from them. Um, and Laban is his father-in-law, and he twists off on Jacob, and there's a whole drama here about him being envious of Jacob, Jacob's being blessed by God, and, and the, the family's now creating all kinds of lies about Jacob, and, and changing the narrative, changing the history, sounds like what's going on in America, and, um, and finally, Jacob says, dude, we got to get out of here, man, this guy's crazy. And, and even the daughters of Laban re recognize, like, yeah, it, dad's nuts. We're out of here. And, and it, it's a picture of, of this principle I want you to understand, that it's okay sometimes to not reconcile. And there are times in which you can't reconcile. And unfortunately, our culture has a different set of morality, and they try to force us to reconcile with people who don't repent, Okay? You can't be a unified society if people believe that men can have babies. You can't be unified. You can't be unified with people who think that free speech should be censored. You can't unify with people who think killing babies is okay. It's impossible. And, you know, the interesting thing is, um, I, I was reading a story here on Blaze Media about uh, uh, Dave Rubin did an a interview with Vivek uh, Ramaswamy, and uh, they were mentioning you know how divided America is, and I agree it's very divided. And you know in the in the interview they were talking about like a pre Civil War mentality that exists now in America, and I would also agree with that because you know in the old days in America you know you had different political parties or whatever and. And in America, because of a Judeo-Christian ethic, people had the same goals, but they had different methodologies and policies in which to achieve those goals, okay? And there was debate on how those, those policies would be achieved. But in the, in the end, it still had a Judeo-Christian foundation of we want to help people and help American citizens and do good to them, okay? We now have policies that are anti-human, now, I mean, just totally off the chart that I don't know who it helps, right, uh, other than them getting reelected. But it's, it, for the most part, we're, we're, we're in a, a situation where I agree. Um, if something doesn't change in our society, you're, you're seeing the formation of a separate society, two societies living together. And I can tell you this, that doesn't work in history. It doesn't work. There's not a single example where you have a society that is split on fundamental reality issues stay together. It doesn't happen. It always, always leads to a civil war because you just come to a standstill. And, and the problem that we have, and, 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 and in the interview they said, and I agree with this, one side wants to force everybody to their reality, okay? And, and so it's not a give and take, we debate it, you know, everyone's free to come up with their own. No, no. No, no. If you don't agree, we're going to fine you, we're going to penalize you, we're going to do all these things. Well, I'm telling you, you start doing that, you're in a pre-Civil War type of mentality, and the only solution is, and there's not reconciliation, the only solution is go separate ways. But here's the dilemma. 
there's no other free land out there like there was when people separated from Britain. There's nowhere else to go. So, that's what we're talking about. So, the times that we're in speak to this. So, you're going to see this on this level, on an individual level with Jacob and Laban. And what I want you to do is apply it to your life, your personal life, because it's going to apply, and then apply it to the society in which you live so you can understand what's the, 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 the dynamic that's happening. Okay, so here's the first verse in chapter 31. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was uh, our father's, and from what was our father's, he has acquired all of this wealth. Every bit of that is a lie. Every bit of it. Okay, so what's going on? Let me give you the context. Jacob has worked for Laban now 20 years. Laban, he's a knucklehead. He's a con artist at the highest degree. Okay, and so he has tricked Jacob and giving one of his daughters to him, slipped her in, and he wanted Rachel, but then he slips Leah in in the night, and so he ends up with having to marry Leah and Rachel and working to pay that off for 14 years. Then, for the next six years, he comes to Laban and says, hey, look, man, um, I have blessed you by working for you, but I need to support my own family. So can you give me, we we'll make a deal here, give me the, the, the minority of the flock that are spotted and striped, which is very little, and I'll take that, and I'll build my flock, and I'll build my wealth through that. And Laban says, no problem, that's a great deal. You've blessed me, why not? Let's do that. That's a great deal. Take all the spotted and speckled animals. Okay, so what has happened in the course of six years? What has happened, and you'll see this in the text, Laban has been deceiving Jacob. Okay, he's been changing his wages, basically cutting his wages ten times, okay, and cheating him. And so Laban is trying to get the upper hand on Jacob, but every time Jake, uh, sorry, every time Laban tries to cheat Jacob, Jacob gets blessed more by God. So at the end of six years, Jacob's got this enormous flock of speckled and striped animals, and he's basically, it's an agrarian society, so that's his wealth. He's been accumulating wealth, right? And he's done it properly, done it honestly and through hard work, okay? And so he's got it. And Laban has now diminished in his flock, diminished in his wealth, and, and he's ticked off. He's tried to cheat and it doesn't work, and every time he cheats them, he gets uh, fired back less and less flocks. And what he doesn't realize is God's doing it to him. He doesn't realize that God's blessing and cursing Laban uh, at the same time. Okay, so what happens? Instead of Laban saying, I wonder why Jacob's blessed. Well, it seems to be that he's in reality with God and God seems to be blessing him. Maybe I should get on the same ticket with him and, and cooperate with God and worship the one true God. But he doesn't. Instead, he does what every person that hates good people does. They lie about them and say, he cheated. He got his wealth by, by evil means and evil motives. He stole from me. And they lie. They change the narrative, don't they? Instead of saying, I need to own what I do, I'm, I'm a loser I, 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 I stink at life. I don't manage my life well. No, I'm just going to go attack good people who sacrifice, obey God, and do what's right. And I'll change it on them. And I'll change it in a lie. So look at the lie they're doing. Jacob, uh, Jacob has taken away all that our fathers. What do you mean? He stole from you? Yeah, that's what they're accusing, that he stole from them. Oh. Sounds familiar that what's going on in culture. Huh. Yeah, these white people stole from us. Yeah, okay. Uh, whatever. You know, they, they took our father's stuff and, you know, it was ours and he acquired all of our wealth. Now we don't have anything because this guy kept stealing stuff. Yeah, I've heard that before. Notice that. You see this in the culture. It's, it's embedded in Marxism. It's embedded in communism because this is an economic situation, okay? And economically, they're saying it's not right that these, these middle class people have wealth. It's not right. We need to take from them and to re redistribute because they got their wealth because uh, they didn't really build, build that business. Remember Obama said that? 
These people didn't really build those businesses. They didn't build their life. They did it on the backs of other people. So we have a right to take from them. And embedded in communism and Marxism is Laban's mentality. I will change the narrative because I envy the material blessings and spiritual blessings they have. So I will lie about them to get their wealth and to steal it back for, and take it from them. And that's what's really happening even right now as we talk about. Now, let's talk about on a personal level. Let's put this, this, what, what's going on here on a personal level. All of us has dysfunctional, psychotic, I don't know what you want to call them, toxic people in your family, okay? You know who I'm talking about. We don't have to name names, but you know who I'm talking about, right? And everybody... Everybody acknowledges that, but here's the problem. They don't know how to handle them. They don't, want, they don't want to handle them in a biblical way. In fact, they default into handling them in the way the world handles them. Okay? And so this person will be in your family and completely change the narrative on you, the reality, and what happened historically. And you're like, dude, I was there. That didn't happen. What are you talking about? And they're like, oh, yeah, that happened. You cheated me. You lied to me. Uh, some of you are nodding your head because you know what I'm talking about because you have these idiots in your family, right? They change the story, and they're impossible to be around, right? They, they suck the life out of you. Oh, every time I go around them in Easter and, and Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's like, oh, they're pulling all my life force out of me and killing me. I go home, and I'm totally wasted after being around them. Ugh. And the problem is no one knows how to handle them. No one puts boundaries and limitations on them, do they? Everyone's, well, let's just forgive and forget. Let's just have the Martha Stewart uh, Thanksgiving. You can't have the Martha Stewart Thanksgiving with a toxic person that changes reality. Okay? You don't get to change reality. And if that's the kind of person you're dealing with, you have to get away from them. Okay? So let me give you now an example of society. Okay? Here's the principle. It is impossible, nearly difficult, extremely difficult to have a relationship with someone who lies about reality, okay? If you believe cats with lightsabers fly on unicorns, you're part of the problem, okay? But we do have people that believe cats ride unicorns with lightsabers. What do you mean? Well, we have people that say men can have a baby. That's on the same equivalent. Why don't we talk about unicorns and leprechauns? Why don't we talk about that? Because they're thinking the same thing, men can have babies. Now, what I'm gonna show you is a video that happened right in our, 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 our Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, Sacramento circus, okay? And I'm going to show you how bad it's becoming when someone changes reality. So what you're going to hear is a parent that is trying to be an activist for not only kids, but the medical industry, because what's getting ready to happen in Sacramento is they're going to pass a bill that says if a doctor doesn't, doesn't uh, penalize their nurses or staff for not, or sorry, for misgendering somebody, they can be fined up to $75,000 to like $120,000 if you're a doctor. I mean, this is big stuff, right? They're forcing it on you. But here's what I want. I want you to hear the parent activist who's on our side, and then I want you to listen to this Lori Wilson, who is a, 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 a California Assembly, and then Mia Bonta, and that name should ring a bell because Bonta, is the, her husband's the Attorney General for California, and they're both crazier in a bed bug, okay? So, listen to the parent, and then watch the reaction, and tell me if we're in a sane world. Afternoon, Aaron Friday, lawyer, Executive Committee for Protect Kids, California Ballot Initiative, <laughs> Democrat and mother of a daughter who used to believe that she was a boy, but with love and compassion embraced her female body. AB 2319 will force feed medical professionals lunacy. Women cannot change into men. Daughters cannot become sons. Birthing people are women. Non-binary is a fiction. Humans are a sexually dimorphic species. The legislature continues to promote a new religion, the religion of transgenderism, that one has an ethereal, fluid, internal sense of self, a gendered soul, if you please, that must be accepted by all, even though there is no scientific basis for its existence. This bill requires that anyone who might interact with a pregnant woman be educated that women can become men with syringes of testosterone or a slice of the scalpel to the breasts. 
It mandates that corrective measures be employed if the employee believes in biological reality. What does corrective measures mean? It sounds like re-education camps, termination, or perhaps the gulag. Now for the punishments against a medical provider for not complying with the forced transgenderism training. It shall be punished pursuant to the Health and Safety Code section 1280.3, upwards to a cool $75,000 for the first infraction and $125,000 for the second. That's right, if a medical provider does not punish an employee for misgendering a pregnant woman or refusing to believe that males have vaginas, it can be out $75,000 or more. With the passage of this bill, California will be one step closer to erasing women, forcing a new religion on the medical community and ripping away First Amendment rights. So I ask you and urge you to vote accordingly. Now watch the response. Are there any other witnesses in opposition in the room? <clears throat> Seeing none, I will bring it back to the committee for comment or question. Dr. Weber? That non-binary people and men of the transgender experience give birth. Thank you for uh, stating the obvious. Oh, did she, did she just say that? Thank you for stating the obvious, men have babies. Thank you for, that's, that's Mia Bonta. That's Lori Wilson. I'm sorry, I don't know how to have a relationship with an individual that's that far out of reality. When you're saying, we used to lock people up for saying stupid things like that. A man can have a baby. Do you understand what I'm talking about? This is Laban. You change the narrative, you change the reality. Look at this, it gets worse, okay? This is New Jersey Senate candidate. Blame yesterday's earthquake on climate change. <laughs> what? I experienced my first earthquake in New Jersey. Uh, when never, we never get earthquakes. The climate crisis is real. What? Even if I took your sham and lie uh, that, that humans produce a poison that, that creates greenhouse gases, which is not true, um, how would that affect an earthquake? I don't know, but I went to sixth grade and got a science, uh, a sixth grade science understanding that earthquakes are not caused by weather. Oh, uh, and these are what, a Senate candidate? Yeah, these are the people running our country. Now, it gets, it's better, or worse, I should say. Now, follow me. Now, I'll lose, I'll lose you if I, you don't follow me. Now, watch this. Last Easter, yes, last Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we celebrated the, the resurrection, and Joe Biden uh, declared that day uh, uh, Transgender Visibility Day or something like that, okay? What you don't understand is the national calendar is full of this nonsense. Watch this. We must also take care to honor Transgender Parent Day on November 6th, Trans Awareness Week, November 9th, 13th or 19th, and International Pronoun Day, October 20th. Trans is distinct from drag. International drag is July 16th. So keep the date on your calendar. But not everyone has a gender or to trans. A, a gender pride day is May 19th. Intersex awareness day is October 26th. You can come out as, as any of these on National Coming Out Day, which is October 11th. Okay, so keep that date. Omnisexual visibility day is July 6th. So mark your calendar for that. Bisexual awareness week ends September 22nd, but jumps right into bisexual visibility day, which is September 23rd. Thank you very much. July 14th is international non-binary, uh, uh, right in the middle of non-binary awareness week, July 11th through 17th. My favorite day is gay uncle day, August 14th. <laughs> you have a gay uncle, that's your date. Okay, speaking of April. We can't forget the ladies. International Lesbian Visibility Day is April 26. Harvey Milk Day is May 22nd. He's a, he's a uh, pedophiler, by the way. And Stonewall Riots Day in June 28th. Pansexuality is widely misunderstood, so it gets a few days. Pansexuality and uh, Pan Romantic Visibility Day, May 24th. But don't forget Pansexual Pride Day, which is December 8th. Spirit Day is October 21st, but I can't remember what that's for. A lot of people confuse Pride Month, June, with LGBT History Month, October. We must observe both, though, as well as Bisexual Health Awareness Month, March, and Trans, Trans Awareness Month, November. 
Human Rights Day is December 10th, and World AIDS Day is December 1st. Don't confuse either with HIV Survivors Day, which is June 5th. May 17th is International Day Against Homophobia, Biphobia, and Transphobia. You should also not be hateful on March 1st because this is Zero Discrimination Day. And the discrimination is definitely not okay on International Day of Silence, which is April 22nd. Were you aware that our calendar, our national calendar, is filled with that nonsense? I, I mean, we're past Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sorry. We're done. We're done. This, this is what we're talking about, okay? Laban, changing the reality, right? So here's what happened. Here's the principle. So the heroes in our society, in America, become anti-heroes. So Superman becomes, you know, bizarro uh, Superman, right? So all of our heroes in our society are now demonized. Washington, Jefferson, all of them now uh, racist, slave owners, trash the history, right? We're bringing in a new reality is what they're trying to do. Uh, American history, does it, you know, it's not 1776, it's 1619, which is all of a lie, and, and they change the history, right? It's all a lie. It's all a lie. But they don't care if it's a lie. So then what happens is the inverse happens in society. Evil becomes good. That's what happens. And good becomes evil, right? And then, then here's what happens. The good people in our society, the good people, um, are castigated as enemies and saying, look, whatever they have, it's because they had evil motives, they use people, and they're just trying to make a buck, and they're, they're capitalistic uh, you know, types of individuals that take advantage and exploit the poor and the needy, and they don't care about anybody. That's, that's Laban. That's what Laban is doing to Jacob, right? Changing the narrative economically. Jacob's just doing his thing, man. He's working hard. Building his flock, just like he had a Baskin Robbins 31 ice cream, and he's making it work, and he's doing well, and they're mad about it. It sounds like the economic envy of every Marxist and socialist and communist in this country. They hate that people are doing well economically. So you know what they have to do? You think, oh, they'll go after the rich. Nope. That's not who they go after because the elites are on their side. Guess who they go after economically? The middle class, thank you very much. We want the middle class, because if we can take their economics away, we take their freedom away, and they become dependent on us. It's, the, it's called economic persecution. That's what Laban is doing to Jacob. He's economically persecuting him, okay? So let, now that we got that established, now watch what happens. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed, it was not favorable toward him as before. Yeah, I bet, because this dude has changed reality. So let me talk a little bit about the countenance and why this is important. It's a Hebraism. Uh, and, and it's not something you can just, like, brush over and not understand. You have to understand countenance for the rest of the Bible. Because the ultimate thing in the book of Revelation, the ultimate goal is to see God's face, to see his countenance, uh, in person, in his presence. And, and it says in the book of Revelation, when we're in the New Jerusalem, we will get to see God face to face. We will actually gaze upon his countenance. Moses wanted this. Remember that? He wanted to see God's countenance. But God says, you can't see my face and live. So he saw the train of the glory that departed from him. Uh, and he was able to see that. And that was even too much for him. Okay. So when we're talking about countenance, it's a Hebraism, okay? It, 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 it means that Laban, his face reflects his heart and his emotions. And one of the things about people, if you want to be able to read people correctly, I mean, by the way, the, the people in the CIA and the FBI know how to read people's faces. They know when they're lying, right? You can, there's tells in their face, well, the, and this goes to the Hebrew culture. You can tell a lot about somebody by looking into their eyes and looking into their countenance. And their countenance will tell you everything. When I see these crazy politicians, uh, well, like when I see like Gavin Newsom, I see, I see his countenance. And his countenance reminds me of the Joker on Batman. <laughs> right? That this guy's up to something. Right? And he's always smiling, but he's like the Joker getting ready to... to taxes some more or some crazy thing like that so 
in the Hebrew culture, someone's face is the dead giveaway if you want to know what's going on inside them. Also, their mouth is a dead giveaway because what they come out reveals their heart. But the face is important. Okay. So Laban's face has changed. He's twisted off now towards Jacob. And I can tell you the emotion. It's, it's hatred. It's envy. It's covetousness. I want what Jacob has. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make up a story about how unjust he's been toward me. Okay? So it's, 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 it's seated hatred, man. And this is what they're brewing in our public schools and colleges and universities. They're telling them that they're victims of the white hetero patriarchy. They're victims of capitalism. They're victims of the free market. Yada, yada, yada. And so all these kids are being trained to want revenge. Okay? It's the same mentality. Now, when we get this first understanding about countenance, we get it early on in the Bible and this is important when you do hermeneutics or biblical interpretation. The first instance of countenance is what sets the definition for the rest of the Bible. So this is where we get the first idea about countenance is with Cain and Abel. And it's with Cain. Now you remember the story very well that Abel was a keeper of sheep but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Right? And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord... Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat. Now, notice in verse 3 it says, and in the process of time it came to pass. Now, you can kind of garner a little bit out of that, but the, what the Hebrew is saying is that the boys, Abel and Cain, have been routinely coming before the Lord, given these, these offerings. But Cain decides to depart from the reality God set. Okay? And so on this day, Cain goes against the status quo of how you get access to God. And if you want to know, it's Abel brought his firstborn of the flock and of the fat. That means God was requiring blood sacrifice in order to gain his presence and to gain his countenance. Okay, So all of a sudden, Cain says, you know what? Status quo, I'm going to change that. I'm going to challenge the... The, the reality that God has set, and I'm going to offer God a different reality. The fruits of my labor from the fields instead of a blood sacrifice. <laughs> and what does this say? And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Okay, so Cain decides, I'm going to challenge that reality. Here's my offering. It's the same thing as Mer Mia Bonta saying, it's totally obvious that a man can have a baby. You, my friend, are challenging the creator. You are challenging how reality is. And I can tell you this. When you go against the creator and you challenge his reality, you are going to be in big trouble. Because what, what, what happened? But he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry. Why? Why is he angry? Because God won't accept his reality. God says, this is the reality. You don't get to decide it, Cain. There is male and female, and that's it. And his, watch, watch what happens. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. There's the key right there. You want to understand when that happened, what's going on here. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why is your countenance fallen? So the Lord already knows. He's asking him rhetorical questions. And he's trying to get Cain to, to repent, and he's trying to get Cain to confess, but he won't. But notice the countenance. Which direction did his countenance fall? We're talking about his face. Where, what direction did his face go to? Down. It fell. Okay? So that's important. Because in order to have a face-to-face -face with God, your face must look upward. Okay? This is the heavenly gaze. Okay? It's a metaphor, but it also speaks of a spiritual reality. If you want God's presence, you are to turn your face to that reality as he says it and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and comply with what God says is possible in order to have a relationship with him. And it's blood sacrifice. We know that to be the blood sacrifice of the Messiah, right? That's the reality. You're not getting to God without going through the blood sacrifice of his son, and that's how you get his face. But your face has to be turned upward. The minute anyone says, you know what, I'm challenging that reality, 
their countenance goes down and it faces down directly into the pit of hell. Instead of the heavenly gaze where God is, you put your face down and you're looking not just to the earth. What's in the earth is hell, the pit. And so that, that face means I am now turning my gaze away from the reality to chaos, to hell. And at that point, your countenance then reflects the attitude inside of you, the hell that's inside of you, the anger, the resentment, the bitterness, the covetousness. And you turn into a demon at that point in time. Why do you think these people are so hostile? Because they've, they're gazing into hell. That's how hell acts like. Hostile, angry, I'm going to get revenge type of mentality. Look at Cain. That, his countenance is now changing. And God's saying, why are you so angry? Because Cain, you know, if you do well, you, will you not be accepted? In essence, is this. God's saying, hey, look, let's talk about this, kid. You know the reality that I set up, don't you? You know right and wrong, don't you? And by the way, everyone in this world knows right and wrong. How do I know that? What's the basis for me saying it? Because the apostle Paul said, the law of God is written on everyone's heart. So even people that don't have the law have the law in their heart, which means they feel convicted. They cannot say, I don't know the law. It's on their heart. So they know right and wrong. So when someone says, I'm going to challenge reality, they're doing it in full knowledge. Full knowledge of what's on their heart. A man and a woman go together for marriage. That's it. Okay? At that point, they're saying, I'm challenging the reality, and I'm going to force it down everyone's neck. And then what happens is they're rejected by God. They're rejected by the reality that in which he created. Because it doesn't work. I don't care how many body parts you cut off. You are not going to change your biology. You're not going to change your DNA. And that becomes angry. Because they can't do it. Even cutting off body parts and putting uh, testosterone in them doesn't work. And they're more angry and more frustrated and mad at God. So guess what they got to do? They've got to find somebody to take their frustrations out. Huh. And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Look, he says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? The, the word accepted in the Hebrew is sayeth. And sayeth means, is reference to his face. If you do the right thing, you can, you, your countenance come back to me. You actually can look at me. But if you do not do well, your face will go down. And guess what's on the ground waiting for you? Do you see right there? So as you're gazing at hell, this animal, and the way it's in the Hebrew, is like this beast animal, demonic animal that wants to have intercourse with you. That's the idea in the Hebrew. Okay? So if you gaze on hell, then right there on the, to your right of your eye is, an, is a beast that wanna, wants to have a sexual encounter with you and take over you. Now you make a decision, Cain. What do you want? You want to challenge reality? Because you don't get to walk away when you challenge reality because when you challenge reality, that animal right there will consume and take over you. And you will not be able to control it once it takes over you. And you already know the rest of the story. When he did let that animal take over him, what then happened? He kills his brother. That's the murderous animal that awaits everybody who resents the good. The animal will not be controlled. This is why millions of people die. This is why Hitler's able to kill six million Jews. This is why people, they don't care, that these tyrants don't care about people because they, the animal has already consumed them. Now, the interesting thing about God, it says, do not hide your face from me in the Psalms. So God can hide his face from us. It means he hides his presence, he hides his fellowship. 
And look at the ironic blessing. You've heard this one, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And what is the ironic blessing? Well, the blessing is that God would shine his face on you, that his countenance would look at you. But here's the caveat. How can you make sure that you're in the presence of God in fellowship with him and your face is looking into heaven and then he can looks at, looks at you? Here's the key. The key is what Isaiah says. But your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have done what? Have hidden his face from you. So when someone wants to challenge reality, they turn their face towards hell and God in response to that turns his face away from them. So they don't get the privilege of having the relationship with God anymore. They don't get the privilege of his fellowship anymore because he turns his face away. The minute they turn back to him and turn his face to him, he will turn his face to them. But it's all dependent on them. Okay, so follow me. When this kind of individual, Laban, Cain, realizes that they are rejected from God because they reject the reality that he gives them, and they realize that God's face is now turned away from them. Then they look at the, the Abels in their life. They look at the Jacobs in their life. They look at the Christians in their life, which would be you. And they say, you know what? He has or she has something I want. A relationship with God. But I don't want to come to God, God's way. I want to do it my way. But I still want what they have. So since I can't have what they have, then no one will have it. So I'll kill them. That's where it goes. That's the mentality. And if you don't think that Cain's not in every human being, you're fooling yourself. Cain is in every human being. You realize that. So counting it means someone's presence and fellowship or disfellowship by the lack of someone's presence. So God is not going to give his presence to people who challenge the reality. By the way... If a believer challenges that reality and says, I'm going to do it my way, right? Then they will lose fellowship with the Lord. And his face will turn away from them. His face will not shine upon them in a blessed state. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about fellowship. So here's the principle. So learning that countenance thing about that's how you get the presence of God is by going by his reality. It's very difficult to have a relationship with somebody who either envies you or resents what you have materially or spiritually. Because deep down, they, you can't have a relationship with someone that wants what you have. So we have a whole host of people who think they're victims in our culture that want what the middle class has. I'm sorry, that leads to civil war. Because at some point, they'll take it by force. That's how it happens. That's the, that's the, the spirit of Cain. I'll just take it. I'll just take what it's mine. I'll, t I'll steal it from you. And, and history is... Is, is full of examples of that. Now watch this. This is interesting. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field and, and, and to his flock. And it said to them, look, I see your father's countenance. Right? He's twisted off. Right? It's, it's not good. That it's not favorable towards me as before. Something's changed in your father. But the God of my father has been with me. So there's a key phrase right there. Despite what he's doing to me economically... God has been with me, and he's going to explain then how God has been with him and prospered him. And he goes, look, and you know that with all my might, I have served your father. So it's like, hey, man, you know I'm a hard worker. I haven't cheated your dad. I've been working hard for 20 years, man. Don't you think I deserve something? I've been, I've been part of, this, part of the, the, this, this, this thing of blessing Laban, your dad, and, and he, he thinks I stole from him. What, what's wrong with him? Yet... Your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. So he's been cheating Jacob this whole time, cutting his wages, not paying him what his, the workers do. Okay. But God did not allow him to hurt me. That's your key phrase. So Jacob's saying, look, even though I was economically persecuted by your own dad, God protected me. And, and, and you want to keep that in mind because right now, you are facing economic persecution. Really, that's what's going on in America and around the world. It is an economic persecution of, of the free market system, which derives itself from the Bible. It's, 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 everything's being attacked. 
And by the way, if you are, you're not aware of this reality, just go to Taco Bell. Just go to Burger King. Just go to McDonald's and check out the prices. Okay? I don't have to make things up. You are in an economic turmoil. But, but, but what I want to turn your attention to, he says, God did not allow him to hurt me. That's true for you. We're in Circus Vargas. This is Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus in California. It's going to get very expensive here quick, really quick. And if God keeps you here, it means that he will protect you, that he will provide for you. You have to keep that in mind, okay? Because that's what, he's, that's, what, that's what Jacob's saying, okay? So the, now, now he's going to give the evidence of how God worked. He says, if he said thus, the speckle shall be your wages, then the flocks bore speckled. He's like, hey, this is how it worked. I don't know how to explain it, but God made this happen. I told Laban that I would take the minority of the flocks. I'll take the speckled. I'll take the stripes, which is nothing. And you know, you know what I did? Every time Laban said, yeah, go ahead and take the speckled, God blessed all the speckled animals. And we just blew up, speckled. So, you know, the flavor of the month was, you know, strawberry. And everyone wanted strawberry this month. And we, we went crazy. And then the next month, he goes, and if the, he thus said, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks were streaked. So it's like, well, I made, uh, I made uh, April chocolate month at, 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 at my 31 Flavors ice cream uh, place. And you know what? Everyone that came in wanted chocolate ice cream. And so I went gangbusters on the chocolate. I made a, a fortune. I said, uh, I did strawberry here and I did chocolate on the other side. Jacob is telling you what God did supernaturally for him despite the economic persecution. Despite it. So, God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me in retribution to what he did. So he's saying, the reason your dad has nothing is not because I stole from him, it's because your dad's an idiot. Okay? He's an idiot and God cursed him because he, he kept trying to do evil things to me. And God paid him back for what he did to me. I didn't steal anything from your father, right? Now let's move to you and I. They just put the minimum wage to $20 for fast food. Okay? And if you think that's not going to affect the economy in California, you're crazy. Because it will have a reverberating effect Already. I mean, these people are laughing all the way to the bank. They don't care if you roll up to Subway or you roll up to McDonald's and you get a Happy Meal and you're busting out of there with a $20 payment to McDonald's for a cheeseburger and fries and a Coke. They don't care because apparently this is about voting, okay? But they don't care about your economics. They don't care if you go to Subway and you get a foot long and it's $20. They don't care. They don't care. But how are you and I going to afford that? Because they're going to say, well, that's, that's just, just fast food. That's just fast food. It won't affect the other restaurants. Oh, yeah? It'll affect the other. Here's, here's In-N-Out. Okay? In-N-Out had to change their prices. Because In-N-Out's on a totally different pay scale. Okay? And so there's March 29th. There's April 1st. So what will happen is here, the reverberating effect on restaurants will be this. Okay, I'm not a fast food place. I, you know, it, it's, you know, it's my own hamburger stand or something like that. Brandon's hamburger stand. I'm paying my employees, uh, you know, 17 bucks an hour. But then I, my employees leave because they can work for McDonald's for 20 bucks an hour or whatever it is. I'm going to lose employees. I can't, I, can't afford to, I can't afford them and pay them. So in order to keep my employees, guess what I got to do? I got to do what in and out does i got to raise my prices. So I'm not going to pay it. You're going to pay it. You're going to pay the price of Gavin Newsom's $20 an hour minimum wage for some dude at Taco Bell putting beans and rice and their sauce in a burrito for 99 cents and get served that junk while I'm paying that person that did that 20 bucks. That's insane. You're going to collapse the economy. <laughs> they don't care. They're laughing all the way to me. This is great. Yeah, awesome. Despite it, remember what he said. God protected me. Okay, watch this. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. This idea of uh, the, the rams leaping has to do with mating. 
So he had a dream that God gave him that he saw the, the animals that he was given were mating and flourishing. So he had confirmation from God that God was doing this in his life, right? <clears throat> then the angel of God, guess who the angel of God is? That's a pre-incarnate Christ. That's Jesus right there. Spoke to me in a dream saying, Jacob, and he said, here I am, I'm ready to do action, Lord. And he said, lift up your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. So Jesus is confirming, I'm going to take care of you, man. I know you're living in California. I get it. Now watch this last phrase, because the last phrase is where I want to insert you and I. For, uh, this is Jesus telling him, for I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. Thank you. For, all, for I have seen all that Joe Biden is doing to you. For I have seen all that Gavin Newsom is doing to you. For all, I have seen all what your crazy uncle has done to you. Or your crazy mom. Or your crazy dad. Or your crazy sibling. I have seen all that they're doing to you. I'm glad that's there. Because I want to know, does God see all the shenanigans that is being perpetrated on me by idiots? He says, yes, I do. I see it all. Thank you. Thank you. And he's also telling you, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to protect you. They're not going to destroy you. I'll protect you through it. You've got to trust me, though, Brandon. You've got to trust me. Don't take revenge out, Jacob. But trust me. I'll take care. I'll take it all the way through. So what's happening with, Ab with, uh, with Laban, why he's ending up destitute, is because he messed with the Abrahamic covenant. How so? Because Jacob is the carrier of the Abrahamic covenant. Oh, yeah. Remember what he told Abraham and Isaac and now Jacob? I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And so Laban has been cursing Jacob because he's, try, he's stealing from him. He's, he's cutting his wages. So every time he does something negative to Jacob, which is a typo, typology of Israel, God then does a, a lex talon and takes a, 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 a pound of flesh out of Laban by having his flocks not, not prosper. So that's how the Abrahamic covenant works. Oh, and let me tell you, it's still in effect. But yet, you're not dealing with Jacob because he's a typology for who? Israel. Israel. Thank you very much. Oh, that's right. Unfortunately for Blinken, unfortunately for the Biden administration, they don't realize the Abrahamic covenant is still in effect. And if you mess with the bull, you will get the horn. Okay, so watch what's happening. Blinken equivocates that Israel is becoming indistinguishable with Hamas. Oh, really? Wow, Hamas, killers. Let me just refresh our minds. Hamas put babies in ovens and cooked them. Hamas took babies out of pregnant women and slaughtered them in front of their families. Hamas raped people repeatedly and broke their hips. They raped them so bad. Okay? They chopped heads off. They, they, they did everything inhumane, demonically you could possibly, and you're going to relate Israel to that. Really? Guess what, Antony? The horn is coming to you. Okay? You're going to pay for what you said. By the way, this dude's background is so littered with evil. Uh, I mean, I can't even believe this guy's in our government. I guess I can. Yes, they are. They're evil. Well, never mind. I shouldn't say that. They're all evil. And then Biden demands an immediate ceasefire without the hostages being released. What are you, crazy, Biden? Are you trying to satisfy the, the radical left? Because Israel can't do a ceasefire if they don't have their hostages. And Hamas has to be eliminated. Every one of the Hamas terrorists has to be killed. Every one of them. Okay? You cannot let Hamas go because they'll reattack. They already said they're going to. But Biden keeps doing that. And then, of course, the UN, which is crazier and a bed bug and evil, uh, accuses Israel of war crimes, ignores Hamas atrocities. And here's what Caroline Glick just came out. And I'm going to interview her in about two weeks. Caroline Glick, there was a leak information that, guess this, get, get this. The Biden administration has a fourfold plan to overthrow Netanyahu and get him out of there. That's what leaked out. You can read the article all you want. Biden's administration war against the government of Israel. They're trying to unseat Netanyahu. They've already met with Gantz separately in Washington and another uh, uh, a liberal from the other liberal party in Israel, apart from the prime minister. Wait a second. I thought our laws say the United States government does not get into the affairs of another government. 
Well, but we are. Well, guess what? You're messing with the Abrahamic covenant, and I can tell you where it's going to end. Now, very difficult to have a relationship that someone thinks like that, right? Very difficult. And so it's difficult to deal with people who don't understand the Abrahamic covenant, don't understand God's, how he rewards people, don't understand how he punishes people, doesn't understand how he allows and restricts things. They, we, we've got an anti-Christian, anti-Christ religion going on in America, okay? Bad. Then he tells them this, I am the God of Bethel. That's where he met Jacob and then Jacob made a vow to him. Where you, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. You understand what's behind here? We've talked about Laban's attitude. We've talked about Cain's attitude. Laban basically has the same attitude as Cain. Or a Marxist, or a communist, or some crazy radical kid in college, in, in the universities. And why is God telling him, you need to leave? You need to get out of here now. What do you think? What, what, what happened to Cain? Because of that. So God is saying, you know what? It's not going to work. This dude is getting so crazy. You're going to have to leave. And you're going to have to go home to where it's safe. Because right now where you're at is not safe. Because this dude's nuts. And it's going to be carried on to a, 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 a greater level like Cain did Abel. Now you say, why? Okay, let's, let's take, we're in the Bible, for goodness sake. Let's take a step back. This is not just Laban getting angry and wanting to do something to Jacob and take his wealth. Jacob carries the Abrahamic covenant. And through him, the 12 tribes will come out. And the nation of Israel. And then guess who comes out of the nation of Israel? Messiah. Oh, wait a second. This is not just some, I'm mad at Jacob. Take a step back, my friends. Satan is all involved in this. He is using Laban to get rid of Jacob once and for all so the line gets cut off so the Messiah or the nation of Israel and Messiah doesn't come. So what will happen is once God starts identifying the line, Satan goes right after to eliminate it. He doesn't want the Messiah to come because that spells his doom. So what's behind Laban, the, the animal that he couldn't tame, is Satan himself. And Satan is now taking over and going to work through the weakness of Laban to take out the patriarch, Jacob. That's why even the attacks on Israel today is to prevent the second coming. Because the second coming is predicated on Israel's acceptance of the Messiah. So no wonder everyone is, sat is satanically inspired to be anti-Semitic. Everything is connecting. So, so God's saying, dude, get out of Dodge. Get out of there. Just like he told Joseph and Mary, take the child, the Messiah child, and get him out of there. Herod seeks his life. Same thing. Same thing. Now watch this. I, I appreciate the girls on this one. And I think you will too. Then Rachel and Leah answered and said to him, is there still any portion of our, our inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not considered strangers by him? For he has sold us, and, uh, sold us and has also completely consumed our money. For all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. You know what the girls are saying? I got, God bless them. For all the, 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 the dysfunctionality among the girls, they get this one right. And this is a big one to get right. They can objectively see what their father did. That's a big one. Because too many people can't see what their parents did. They won't objectify their parents. They idolize them. I, I've had people tell me they were molested year upon year upon year by one of their parents. And they still idolize that, that pervert. And you're like, what are you, insane? Yeah. When you idolize a parent and you want them to be something they're not, you idolize them and you go blind to them. I got to appreciate that about the girls. You know what they're saying? Our dad was a loser. This guy, he sold us like property. He, he sold us out. And, and, and they sold, he basically sold servitude 
with the girls to get Laban's work. So he treated the girls like property. My dad didn't love us. And then they say, and this fool of a dad of ours was cursing you, Jacob, and then God take, took all of his property away. Well, some of that property was supposed to go to us. And so he can't even give us anything because he's lost everything because he's an idiot. He's lost everything because God cursed him, and that was some of ours. So he, our father lost our own inheritance. We have nothing. So they're like, Jacob, dude, we're out of here. This guy's a loser. I don't want anything to do with him. Let's go. I got to appreciate that. You got to appreciate that. Because Jesus said, if you, love, if you love your parents, your family more than me, you have nothing to do with me. You have to hate your father and mother and love me. What did he mean? You have to see your parents or family members objectively. And if you can see them objectively, then you can put Christ in the proper position in which he needs to be. Laban can't do that. His kids can't do that because they're taking his side. It's like, dude, your dad was ripping people off. Don't you guys see that? So the girls, they break away, and they're like, no, dad's a loser. Okay. Now, we're not, then the girls are not whining. Jacob's not whining. Poor me. I'm a victim. I had bad parents. Hey, look, man, I've been counseling 20-something years. If you had good parents, great. That's awesome. Good for you. But the majority of people had dysfunctional, toxic parents. They love their parents, but relationally, they're just horrible. They just they don't want to have, have a relationship. They're terrible. And it is what it is. Okay, we're not blaming that, but you have to be objective enough to see it. Because here's what happens. If you're not, you will take people's side that you shouldn't be taking sides for. You will idolize people who are crooked and evil and wicked and liars. Because why? I, I hope mom one day sees the light. I hope dad one day sees the light. Or my brother or my sister or my siblings or my adult children see the light. Probably a good chance they're not. We're going to hope and pray for them. But what does that mean for me? What did it say? I'm getting out of here. Because how, how do you have a relationship with anybody when you find out they used you? How do you have that? Because they looked at you as an object. No, it's something to be manipulated. Well, what kind of relationship is that? You're going to idolize that and say, keep running to daddy after he molested you for five years? You're going to keep running to daddy? What are you, insane? Being used is happening all over. Australia is going to use its people, put a digital identification on them, and Bill Gates is happy to start doing this in all the countries around the world. Talk about being used. The society will be used. Humans will be used. Then Jacob rose and set his sons and his wives on his camels, and he carried away all his livestock and all the possessions which he had gained. He took everything. I'm out of here, dude. And he, his acquired livestock which he had gained from Padama ran to go to his father Isaac in the land of Canaan. Good for him. Good for the girls. Get away from that kind of person. They're toxic. So sometimes separation is, is needed and is required because reconciliation is impossible with some people. Now, here's what I want to throw at you at the end of this. So hang with me. How do we work in forgiveness in this? Because there's people in your family you're not going to be able to reconcile with. And that's okay. But how do I deal with forgiveness? Well, there's two types of forgiveness in the Bible. You have to know which one you're dealing with. There's horizontal forgiveness, and then there's vertical forgiveness. So let me explain horizontal forgiveness. Horizontal forgiveness has to do with the person to person. That's why it's horizontal. The, the offender and the offendee. Okay? That's the relationship. And what happens on this one, in order to have horizontal forgiveness, the person who offended you must repent. They must do it in person and repent, ask for forgiveness, and then you are required to give that forgiveness. But you are not required to give horizontal forgiveness if they don't repent. Okay? You are not required to give reconciliation to anyone that you don't want to give. Like, you might forgive somebody, and they repented, and they said, I'm sorry. But you're saying, dude, I can never trust you again. You burnt me so bad, I'm never going to be reconciled to you. 
Do not be guilted by this culture that tells you you have to forgive and be reconciled. That's a lie. You do not. I don't have to be reconciled with someone that burnt me. I have to forgive if they ask for forgiveness, but I don't need to be their friends anymore. I don't have to be their friend. God doesn't require that. Well, God says to love them. Okay, what, what love are you talking about? Agape love. That means I seek the best for them. That doesn't mean Philadelphia love, which I'm, I'm their friend now, or Storge love, and they're a, they're a relationship with me. It's only agape. And agape is I can love my enemies. I seek the best for them. Okay? So horizontal forgiveness is Luke 17. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. Confront him. Okay? Most people in their families won't confront the perpetrator. They won't confront them. They sweep it under the rug, right? And they become a victim. They want everyone else to confront them. And if he repents, forgive him. Notice the condition. If he repents, then forgive him. And if it sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. That's the condition. He must repent or she must repent. What does repent mean? I stopped doing the activity that got me in trouble with you. Okay. Now, let's, let's talk about vertical forgiveness. Very important you know the difference. Vertical forgiveness does not require the person to be in present with you. It does not require repentance on the person. Because the person might be dead. The person might live in another state or in another country. Or you'll never just see this other person again. Okay? Okay. So what happens when a situation where the person doesn't repent, they don't ask for forgiveness, they're dead, okay, or whatever. Then what are you to do where there's a thing called vertical forgiveness? And the vertical forgiveness is between you and God, not you and the person, but you and God. So know the difference. So I go before God, and I say, Lord, this person harmed me, and they owe me a debt. That's what, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who trespass against us, forgive us our debts. So they owe me a debt because they harmed me. So what I do in the act of vertical forgiveness is I give the debt to God and say, you, this is what they owe me. I'm giving this over to you, and I'm trusting you for the justice to make everything right, whether you do it in this life or the next. I'm trusting your justice, and I'm releasing the debt to you. That's what vertical forgiveness is about. You have to do that. Otherwise, you don't get fellowship forgiveness from God if you don't do that. Now, does that mean I formally forgave them? No, it does not. Because the person never came to me and asked for forgiveness, nor did they repent. They're dead. But I can forgive them to God. And I have to do that. I, that is not conditional. That is unconditional. You have to do this. Okay? Okay? It doesn't get the person off the hook. It just, you give the penalty over to God. Okay. So what happens is, this is Mark 11. And whenever you stand praying, so this is between you and God. You're praying. You're communicating with God. If you have anything against somebody or anyone, forgive. Do the vertical forgiveness. That your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. Ah, there it is. So the vertical forgiveness keeps me in fellowship with the Lord. If I do not give vertical forgiveness to an individual, then what will happen is my fellowship with God will be removed. Not salvation. I'm talking fellowship. I won't get fellowship forgiveness. So my duty as an unconditional person, uh, as far as offering uh, salvation, is to stay in fellowship with God. Well, i got to give it unconditionally to God. But I don't have to give it to the person if they don't repent. Okay, you have to know the difference. So at the end of the day, we can offer forgiveness even if the person repents. But I don't, I don't have to go their way anymore. I don't have to be with them anymore. I can go my own separate way. And if someone tells you different, that's unbiblical. Biblical, I just showed you what it means. And there are necessary separations that need to happen. Okay? Don't feel guilty for separating. Don't let anyone make you feel guilty. I hope seeing this shows you that you can release some of the baggage you were holding on to so that you can escape from that. Because ultimately, the big picture is God wants to reconcile with every human being. But will every, every human be reconciled to him? 
No. So he gives people that freedom that they can go their own way. That they can do their own thing. That they can confront the reality that he created. That they can challenge the reality. And he lets them go their way. Not without penalty. Not without cost. But he does give them their freedom. And what did Jesus say about this? Narrow is the path and few who find it. But broad is the road of destruction. And many find that. God wants to reconcile. The problem is not with God. The problem is with humans. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for what we can learn from Jacob and, and, and the situation he had with Laban. For goodness sakes, we see ourselves in that with our own family members, with Gavin Newsom, with Joe Biden or whatever. The economic persecution that comes upon the, on, on anyone that's trying to just do good in their life. <sighs> Give us the strength to, to, and, and the faith, Father, like Jacob had said, look, the Lord protected me. The Lord provided for me. And we know that you'll do that for us, Father. Thank you. Help us to have that faith in you. And Father, if there's anyone here that hasn't got saved, that hasn't come through the narrow path, they would realize the reality is they have to go through Jesus. That Jesus offers eternal life to anyone who believes. And he, and he proved that by who he was and who he is and, and, and what he did. He died on a cross for their sins, was buried, rose on the third day to offer this eternal life to anyone who would just simply believe in him. So simple. I pray hearts would do that today if they haven't. Bless us now as we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.